From Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Welcome to Middle East Focus. I'm Alistair Taylor, and the Eye's editorial director. And today we're going to be talking about the coronavirus pandemic and the questions it raises around surveillance, privacy, and public health. The rapid spread of COVID-19 in the Middle East and around the world has prompted the introduction of a variety of new means of surveillance in an effort to identify and track those who may have contracted the disease. An effort that has now taken on ever greater urgency as the total number of confirmed cases globally tops 1.5 million. To discuss how the tension between public health and privacy is playing out in the Middle East, I'm joined today by two great guests, Mike Sexton and Eliza Campbell. Mike is the director of MEI's cyber program, and Eliza is the associate director. Mike, Eliza, thank you for joining us, and welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us. Great to be here. Mike, to start off with, can you give us a sense of how countries in the Middle East are using surveillance technology to deal with the pandemic? Yeah. So there have been a few uh, kind of isolated stories. I haven't seen anyone doing a kind of wrap up of how country by country the governments are are instituting surveillance in order to um, prevent the spread, track people's movements. In Dubai, they are using license plate scanners. Um, so everyone kind of by default in Dubai, if your car is on the road, will be ticketed unless you have a waiver uh, saying that you're either an essential worker or that you filed a permit to go to a grocery store at a certain time. Saudi Arabia is using surveillance drones, at least in Mecca, to make sure that the streets are empty. Israel is using cell phone tracking information that's previously been used just for uh, counterterrorism to track people's movements and ensure that they aren't making unnecessary travel. Um, The Israeli uh, surveillance company NSO Group is also working on developing a kind of big data analysis tool that, at least in theory, is supposed to also help track people's phone movements um, and, and prevent unnecessary contact. I saw Tunisia has also deployed robots on the, the streets of Tunis that will go up to you and ask you questions if you're out and about as to why you are, which seemed a bit uh, dystopian. Eliza, looking across the region, what balance are governments striking between public health and privacy rights? And, and what does that kind of tell us about their priorities? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, response has been really varied um, across kind of the country's level of tech infrastructure and their previous experiences with public health crises. Um, but as well as with what is economically at stake for each country. So, for example, the Gulf's experience with MERS um, a couple of years ago made it kind of naturally more aggressive with testing, more aggressive with mass tracking of cases. Um, and, for example, so Dubai is on track currently to potentially lose 5 to 6 percent of its overall GDP, um, given that it's heavily invested in tourism and trade. So that means that those countries, as Mike mentioned, Dubai, different parts of the UAE have kind of been really aggressive about this kind of tension between public health and privacy. Other countries have sort of brought up this other question about the flow of information, the flow of information and kind of ramping up discussions about how much should be made aware on the part of citizens by their governments has really been a question that's been raised when it comes to this question of public health versus privacy. So there's been some reports, for example, that um, some medical staff in Egypt and other countries have been referred to to government police uh, for questioning as a result of videos or posts that they've made that have criticized the government's response. Um, Similar cases, I think, have been reported in Turkey and throughout the region kind of mislabeling or taking advantage or kind of um, obscuring the difference, I think, between misinformation, disinformation and legitimate need to know information. Um, So it really depends, I think, on government's priorities. And it's really contingent, I think, upon previous experience in that in that country dealing with these questions of public life and private life and especially of how the government gets involved. So it'll be, I think, increasingly um, the question that will be raised will be one, especially as the shutdown goes on and jobs are lost, of thinking about long term economic damage. And I think that more than anything will continue to shape the priorities that different countries have in their response and how aggressive they are about surveilling or tracking or using kind of big data solutions for responding to this crisis. Mike, how does this compare to what we've seen in East and Southeast Asia, where governments in places like South Korea and Singapore have introduced pretty aggressive and invasive measures? Yeah. So as Eliza had mentioned, uh, Middle Eastern government's previous experience with the MERS virus, um, similarly, the SARS virus has given East Asians kind of 
a sort of head start in terms of testing infrastructure, in terms of uh, the the sort of foresight to establish surveillance in infrastructure, especially in countries like Singapore, where surveillance is really normalized. There has not been much of a hitch to develop new programs that are tracking um, actual people's proximity to one another using Bluetooth. Uh, so two, if two phones come close to each other, that can pl- flag the government to say, you know, there's been contact between these two people. If one of them tests positive for coronavirus, um, you know that they are both at risk. So the the systems in the Middle East are sort of more limited, I would say, whereas in, in China, South Korea, um, and Singapore, they're much more holistic, uh, covering not just surveillance, but testing. But that said, there's a lot of commendable examples considering uh, the United Arab Emirates, at least reportedly, has tested more people per capita than anyone else in the world. So even though they don't get as much attention, there is a lot that they are getting right. Eliza, at times, arguments about personal privacy versus public security can seem a bit abstract to the average person, but it's hard to think of a kind of better or more pressing example than the coronavirus pandemic. Given the severity of the crisis, does the situation warrant taking exceptional measures? And and where do you draw the line? So I think this has sort of brought into sharp focus a lot of these questions for people for sort of the first time. As you said, there's not really a better example of a time to be grateful for big data or for infrared heat tracking than there is right now. And these are certainly exceptional times. And in a way, they do call for extraordinary measures. But in my mind, and I think from um, the perspective of some experts um, and organizations that I'm talking to in the region, the line should be drawn kind of in a country by country basis based on how state powers intersect with um, shifts in governments and governance patterns and shifts in the relationship between civil liberties and, uh, and sort of private expression, and whether or not we're likely to see things go back to the way before, or whether we're likely to see kind of a mass par- uh, you know, paradigm shift in how we think about the role of the state. Um, so for example, something that I've been talking to some um, researchers and activists on has to do with biometric uh, data collection on the part of humanitarian organ- aid organizations. And this is something that has become um, kind of more common in a lot of ways. It's a really excellent and efficient way to track people, um, to you know, note kind of the spread of medical risks, um, me- medical risks and conditions, um, and also to reduce fraud. But on the other hand, um, especially as these technologies are used in enclosed reception centers or detention centers, it really raises some serious questions about how and where such technologies might be used kind of at scale in the future, you know, given kind of how the shape of the pandemic goes going forward. Other countries, you know, Lebanon, 21 municipalities, I think in Lebanon, have introduced special curfews or movement restrictions just on refugees. And then on the other hand, kind of thinking about, as I said, the information flow side, Reporters Without Borders has reported that seven journalists so far have been arrested in Turkey for spreading panic about the virus, and at least 385 people are currently being investigated for critical social media posts. Um, And at the same time, in Iraq, um, the government, for the first time, um, has threatened to suspend the license to operate for the Reuters news agency for their reporting about, you know, how the reported number of cases in Iraq may actually be thousands more than was initially reported. Um, So this really brings to the fore... um, kind of this larger question of deciding about where the governments of the future want to go. And I think, um, you know, outside reporting and research has shown that, um, you know, as Mike mentioned, the priorities are really different from region to region and government to government, but that we should draw the line somewhere where it comes thinking about larger vulnerability, thinking about poverty, thinking about the right to movement, and especially among the, the region's, you know, spiraling refugee crisis that when these issues start to really threaten and imperil the lives of the most vulnerable, that's a good sign that it's time to think about sort of putting safeguards um, on how these types of powers might be used into the future and how they might be normalized for sort of more mass, more um, kind of endemic usage. Mike, along similar lines, is it possible to have a, a kind of more democratic surveillance system? And if so, what would that even look like? Yeah, so I think the best recommendation that I have seen is that if there is going to be a form of mass surveillance of um, tracking people's movements, that that information should be solely owned and operated and accessed by public health. If you consider the way that For instance, in Israel, the phone tracking data that they are using to monitor people's movements actually came from counterterrorism. The ideal that a lot of privacy advocates that I've read have said 
is that it should be the other way around. It should start with public health and it should stay there. No one should be getting arrested based on like information that was found from these movements, unless it's because they were intentionally uh, violating quarantine or social distancing orders. Police should not have access to it. Intelligence should not have access to it. I don't have a whole lot of faith that these sorts of measures and precautions are going to be taken uh, in most Middle Eastern countries, just considering how high the concern of terrorism and national security is there. But that is that would be the best way to to keep some privacy protections while still doing public health monitoring. Eliza, kind of jumping off from what Mike just said, in your view, what safeguards would need to be put in place to ensure, uh, in particular, the appropriate use of location data? Yeah, I mean, location data is kind of a way of, or it's a central function of how we live and work now. There's nothing really inherently violating about location data being captured. Most apps and platforms that we use in the U.S. automatically track it or require that you opt out. So the main issue is making sure uh, that when and how it's used is something that's done on the basis of informed consent. And that, as Mike said, doesn't kind of bleed into other areas of government authority and to make sure that these kind of personal privacy regulations are appropriate for the context. Um, It also depends on the type of data that's being collected. So some location data collected by GPS is extremely detailed. Um, This is the type of data that's commonly collected by weather apps or e-commerce sites, which is later sold for targeted ad purposes and can kind of have person-to-person identification information. And then on the other hand, some of it is more general. It might not include preferences. It might not include as granular information about the individual's movement. Um, So it really varies. Um, GPS information, for example, is accurate to, I think, about 16 feet or five meters. Um, Well, mobile network data, which is a different type, is accurate only to about 158 feet, um, which I think is about 50 meters. This is the difference between um, how far you know where someone is like in a room in the house versus locating what general street they're on. So I think what type of data collection, what type of location information um, governments use will be really crucial. There's also the way in which it's aggregated. Um, So making sure that collected location data is done in its aggregated form. Um, and not pseudo-anonymized, which technically protects protects an individual's name, but allows one person to be traced consistently over time. There's obviously a really critical ongoing conversation about this right now, especially as one person may kind of be the vector for, you know, a series of cases after that. Um, But it's important to keep in mind that location data has been used successfully before to control outbreaks of diseases. Um, For example, there was a case of location data being successfully used to track cases of malaria in Kenya, another one where it was used to track dengue in Pakistan. But to also keep in mind that in both of those cases, that data was later kept by the governments in question, and I think, um, according to some reports, used for nefarious purposes afterward. So I think it involves each country really taking a serious look at the types of regulations they have around location data, which may be non-existent at this point, um, and sort of deciding on a case-by-case basis how and where such data will be um, sort of generally available to different agencies or different um, parts of governing institutions and how it won't be. Mike, looking at this from the perspective of tech companies, what obligations and responsibilities do they have here? Should they be handing over this kind of data to the government or taking a different approach on their side to better safeguard consumers? I think that that is a really tricky question. Uh, When it comes to telecom providers, especially in the Middle East, there's really not much of an option if you provide a warrant to a telecom company, especially in the Middle East, where many in many Arab countries, they are government owned or very close to the government. There's there's not much of an option for there for them. I think there's an interesting case when it comes to other apps that track people's locations. So if you consider an app like Facebook or um, or Twitter, or Foursquare, something that a lot of enough people use that the company would be able to identify if there were a large gathering of people, which would be a violation of social distancing orders. I honestly do not know how I would think about the privacy of the users at that point. I would think there is a public health obligation to report something like that to the government and to identify those people. But considering how this data is not always accurate and could end up 
punishing people who were caught due to some sort of error in in location data is is a really tricky question um, that I think given the the just sheer scale of issues that we're facing right now, I, I do not think that uh, either in the United States or in the Middle East, anyone is really equipped to handle. Eliza, you spoke earlier about the use of data and how it could be used after the fact, after it was gathered for its intended purpose. I'm just kind of wondering on the the on that continuum, how much of a risk is there uh, that temporary emergency measures above and beyond just data, if you were, for example, to set up a national facial recognition system with with an eye to tracking people. What happens to that once the, the, the coronavirus crisis is over? Not just the data, but any sort of infrastructure or systems that you put in place. Well, the prevailing wisdom is that you should never let a good crisis go to waste. And I'm suspecting that that will continue to be the case with the COVID-19 outbreak. And it's, of course, important to remember that public health measures have always depended on some kind of surveillance or another, even back to the, you know, the early 1900s. But at the same time, uh, another paradigm that I think um, a lot of people in this space have been discussing is the parallel, as we talked about briefly, between what's happening currently and sort of the response um, post 9-11 and kind of thinking about how these inflection points um, in some cases have the, the potential to really allow for ramping up of warrantless surveillance, um, complete sort of changing or changing the paradigm about how we think about information collection. And I think China's response um, kind of shows us this kind of um, potentially frightening new way for the future. You know, we're seeing neighborhood monitors that log movement and temperature, mass surveillance of mobile, you know, credit and movement data, South Korea's use of CCTV and credit card data to track movement, um, Taiwan's integration of health and travel data of patients across platforms. And in a way, there is a plat or a parallel to the ways that states responded post 9-11 to, uh, to track the threat of global terror. Um, so, for example, the U.S. kind of expanding into warrantless surveillance on the part of the NSA, uh, the Total Information Awareness Project, which was um, aimed towards identifying potential terrorist subjects based on mass collection of digital data. And at the same time, it's important to remember that around 2002, 2003, this was the time that um, it was really the point at which, um, in terms of private internet use, um, we sort of decided as a society um, how privacy would be sort of treated by these internet platforms. And the fact that as a result of kind of the justified, I think in some cases, um, increased security concerns, there weren't at the time a lot of privacy commercial pr protections put in place for location tracking or for like cookies on a browser and this ultimately paved the way for the expansion of companies with a business model like that of Google or Facebook. Um, and it's important also to think that when it comes to to think about when it comes to location data, there's the potential for things to be recorded falsely or for mistakes, obviously. And all of these, you know, a lot of the facial recognition systems that are being produced by China run on AI that was built by humans. So it builds in um, systemic bias and it could potentially confuse one thing for another to, you know, serious detriment. So for example, if a biometric data tracking system could track somebody's temperature, presumably that could generally be generalized out to emotions. So you could eventually track someone's emotional response um, during the time of a speech given by a government leader. And this could be really critical, especially in more authoritarian states where wanting to understand people's response to information and understand their level of loyalty could be really, could be really dangerous. Um, so in general, um, thinking about the risks is, is, I think, a really serious question that it's contingent upon all of us to do. Um, and it's not completely unheard of that, um, you know, China's system of color coding smartphone apps to people as green, which means they're safe to travel or red, which means they're subject to travel restrictions. This could be something that could easily extend or has extended past the outbreak period and remain a feature of public life. I think such systems are already kind of nominally in place and in places like the West Bank and Gaza. And it's not, you know, ridiculous to think that this might become something that is sort of justified in the name of public safety once um, the COVID-19, God willing, kind of dies down. So I think this is something that could easily become a really critical threat um, kind of to global civil liberties looking into the future and that I hope that we continue to keep a close eye on. Like looking at the potential long-term consequences of this sort of widespread introduction of surveillance technology, do you think we run the risk of, of in effect, normalizing mass surveillance? 
I think we we're already well past that. I think mass surveillance has been um, increasingly normalized over the past 20 years. And the way that I really think about this is thinking not just from the perspective of of a a less than free country, a non-democratic country like many uh, countries in, in the Arab world. If you consider it just from the perspective of a free and open democracy like the United States, where presumably people would like to have their privacy protected in good times if they felt safe, if you were a member of Congress thinking about, say, repealing the Patriot Act, you need to weigh then what would the consequences be for you personally if you were to vote to repeal it, it were to be repealed, and then there was a major attack because the blowback would be severe and clear. Uh, it's, it's similar to the way I think that as much as people all want to close Guantanamo Bay in America, no one wants Guantanamo Bay detainees in their state. So you, you end up um, with these kind of countervailing priorities and, and the security one is always going to win out, especially when you're thinking about somewhere like the, the Middle East where people don't have a vote and it's essentially either the, the government is responsive to people's needs or the government faces a revolution. We're running short on time, but before we wrap up, I'd like to get your your final thoughts, Eliza, starting with you. Is there anything that you're going to be paying particularly close attention to as the situation evolves over the coming weeks and months? Yeah. So something I'll keep an eye on uh, is China's global ambitions looking to the future in the midst of this crisis. In part of this larger digital authoritarian state that many people have written about that they're kind of growing independently and sort of showing this model for other states that might want to mimic it. Um, but as well, you know, $17 billion invested in this digital Silk Road for loans and investments in telecom, mobile payment systems, big data, facial recognition technologies. So it's likely that partnerships or cooperations between various states in the region and China will play a significant role when it comes to determining how exactly each state makes uh, these decisions about privacy and um, technological kind of incursions into civil liberties. So that's something to keep a watch on. You've got the last word. Any Any final thoughts? Yeah, I really think that we are in a similar way to how 9-11 sort of put terrorism as a global priority, even though it was something that was around for, I mean, decades, if not, depending on where you kind of start <laughs> a millennia um, before 9-11. Uh, this is going to put public health on people's radar, and I hope that it will mean greater investments in organizations like the World Health Organization and expanded access and production capability for stuff like tests. But uh, I do worry that the surveillance system, and especially a lot of the surveillance that is now even more extensive at least possible to be more extensive than it was in just the post 9-11 area with things like Bluetooth that was not really a widespread technology in 2001. Um, using Bluetooth to track people's uh, close contacts with one another, uh, this sort of surveillance I'm, I think is, is likely to stay and is not going to be uh, in any way a boon for people's privacy or, or right to to assembly um, in in the region for a while. We'll have to leave things there for now, but this is a hugely important topic and one that I'm sure we'll be revisiting again soon. Eliza, Mike, thank you both for joining the program today. Thanks so much. Glad to be here. Yeah, thanks so much. And thank you uh, as well to our audience for listening in and to our production team for their work on today's program. We will see all of you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.